All right, very cool guest today, uh, Mr. Bob Herrick from Sports Illustrated. Bob, thanks for uh, carving out some time to come on our show. Happy to do it. I appreciate you having me. Thanks. Uh, British Open was last week, and, and as we were talking before we hit the record, you were over there. So a lot of electricity in the air for a lot of different reasons. Can you just kind of tell everybody uh, from your perspective and experience what that was like and talk a little bit about the, the things that were going on in particular – you know, maybe even the last round? Yeah, well, first of all, when when they have an open at St. Andrews, I think that already elevates a special tournament a little bit more anyway. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's sort of viewed as the home of golf. It's been played there the most times. I think that was the 30th out of, um, out of 150 opens. That was the 30th. And, uh, you know, it usually doesn't disappoint. It's got a great atmosphere. You know, the, the first – hole in the 18th hole and a couple others are sort of right there in the town um you know every, everybody's sort of into the occasion and uh and then you know it delivered um you know the weather was pretty good um the the course was tricky enough might not look like it by the scoring cam smith was 20 under par which actually beat tiger's 2000 record there of 19 under um but still um you know, I don't think people were thinking it was too easy. Uh, and you had the Tiger missing the cut, sort of the emotional farewell maybe to St. Andrews, the whole Swilkin Bridge walk over, the fans cheering him the entire way. Uh, you had Roy McIlroy in the mix, and Roy was incredibly popular there. Obviously, that's his part mm -hmm. of the world. Um, and, um, you know, they were rooting for him hard. Um and then you have a guy hit all 18 greens in regulation that has no three putts, beats his the guy he was tied with. Everybody else was four behind, and he still doesn't win. It was just kind of a weird, fluky thing that happened to Rory in a great final round, obviously, by Cam Smith to shoot 64, 30 on the back nine. You know, I don't think anybody had ever shot 64 in the final round to win at St. Andrews. Um, <clears throat> and that's, um, that's pretty good golf there. Uh, you know, it, it's um, to do that under those circumstances uh, was was a really impressive and very well deserved win by him by doing it that way. You know, th th there's been a lot of chatter on Twitter and social media, and I've been asked by friends of mine uh, as well. Is the and the question being, did do I think or was the perception that that Smith won it or did Rory lose it? And I actually had to sit back and think pretty hard on that because that, that's a very good question. Um, what, 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 being there, what, what was your, what's your view on that? Yeah, I mean, I, as good as Rory played, it's not like he gave it away. He didn't Vandeveld it on the 18th hole. Right. That, that's why I have a hard time thinking that Rory lost it. I mean, he got beat. Yes, of course, he could have done more. You know, he shot 70. He actually didn't even finish second. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Cam Young beat him by one shot, eagling the last hole. I, but I would also add that Rory was trying to hole out to tie from the last hole. My guess is he birdies that last hole otherwise. He's, he's going to hit something in there uh, that's going to give him a better chance to make a birdie if that's what he needed. But that said, you know, I mean, sure, could he have made some putts? Yes. He had, he had a bunch of near misses for birdies. Um, there's some short par fours where frankly, he probably needed to pitch it up closer, give himself a closer birdie putt. You know, it, mm -hmm. the, 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 one of the reasons he hit all 18 greens is because one, the course plays relatively short for him. And two, the greens are huge, you know? And I mean, in, on one hand, it's a credit to him that he didn't three putt any because those greens are so big. If you're not, if you're not close, sometimes you can have 40, 50 feet foot putts and two putting is difficult on the other hand when you're so close to the green so often you've got to knock one in there tight once in a while give yourself a four or five footer and he really didn't do that you know his both of his birdies he only had two birdies 16 pars like i said most times that gets it done when you have a lead like you like he had over everybody but one guy um but uh he just you know his both of his birdies were two putts so it was just kind of like to, to hit 18 greens and have 36 putts is just kind of, I don't know, like I said, it's almost flukish. Like it's just a weird occurrence. You just don't see that happening very often. 
Do, do you think that he got too conservative in his play as far as uh, the pins were obviously tucked because that was the only defense that the course had. And going into the round, uh, there was some discussion that, that he had been texting with Tiger on strategy mm -hmm. and how to approach the final round. Um, and, and given that he had the, the lead over th – there were only so many guys that could catch him from a historical perspective. I think it was how, only three guys were within four shots of the lead. Right. And Cameron Young was – was he second going to final round? Then Smith and I can't remember who the other one uh, – Victor Hovland. Correct. All those guys were – Well, Victor was tied – Victor was tied with them. Yeah. Right. So do, do you think that maybe his strategy was – conservative being the, the right thing to do, but it ended up being biting him in, in, in the rear end in the end and that Smith just went on a, on a tear to start that back nine? Well, first of all, you wouldn't expect somebody... Nine, to, 99 out of 100? Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't expect somebody like Cameron Smith or anybody to do what he did. And, and, and Tiger's advice also included taking care of the short par fours, which he didn't, which, which he mm -hmm. didn't do. He only birdied the 10th. Um, the ninth is a pretty short par four. Um, uh, I believe it's uh, 13. That's another one that's you could knock it in there close. He had a great approach on 17, had 15 feet. Now, that's not a birdie hole, but he had about 15 feet and he, and he didn't make it. You know, so I think the, his, his advice was sort of, you know, avoid the big numbers and take care of the holes that you take care of and you're going to win. And, and that that's true. He would have, I mean, Rory probably needed, you know, probably should have shot 68 and that would have been good enough for a, for a, for a playoff. He should have been able to shoot 68 mm -hmm. given where he hit the ball. So I don't think the strategy was wrong. I just think the execution wasn't what he needed it to be. And he would probably admit that, Hey, I needed to hit and it closer. He didn't birdie 14 either. Being Correct. next to the green on, was it, was it 14 and two? Uh, correct. That's a good point. Uh, par five, you know, so Tiger said, take care of the par fives. There's one he didn't take care of. Take care of the short par fours. Nine and 10 are relatively short. Um, there's a couple others. You can't just assume you're going to, you know, uh, you're going to drive some of those greens. Uh, but, um, but that's what he did on 10 and two putted for birdie, you know? So, um, mm -hmm. I don't think the strategy was wrong. I just think, you know, a, he didn't quite, um, you know, get as low as he needed to. And, and he was unlucky that somebody stepped up with, you know, let's be honest, it's a round of a lifetime that Cam Smith shot there under those circumstances. Yeah, I agree. The, the, the difference that I see, I mean, it's obviously hard to compare people against Tiger, but he, he's, he's reset the bar. So anyone that comes along in history is going to be measured against Tiger, I think in a very similar way that it was measured against Jack for so long. But the, the thing that I remember about Tiger is, is he, he, he would make guys come get him and, and let them make the mistakes where he would play mostly to the middle of the green or at a minimum the strong side. He, he very rarely, if ever, missed a short-sided green on a Sunday where he had the lead. Um, and then, But if somebody did make a run and they started to approach, well, then he would start shifting his, his targets closer to the hole or start working the ball into the hole more so that he could uh, – accelerate that lead again if he needed to if, and and if he executed as mm -hmm. you alluded to that Rory quite didn't do that I, I just got the feeling that, that Rory was being a little too conservative in that and I I, I didn't watch it all the, the entire final round I, I'd, I'd watch an hour and I'd have to step go do something do yard work or something for 40 minutes and I'd come back it just seemed like he, he was he was accepting that the pins were tucked and he was going to have 30 to 35 feet where I think Maybe when he saw Smith making that run, now he becomes a little more aggressive. I think that's a pretty good assessment of it. I, you know, I think he was, he was going to be careful. You're not going to go at some of those pins because if you miss, you're dead, you're in trouble. Um, so you're going to take your, your, your two putts and get out of there. Um, there are some places he possibly could have been more aggressive, I suppose. I was surprised he didn't, wasn't able to drive the 18th green, frankly, you know, as, Me as, too. as, as long as Rory is, you know, he, he, he mishit that shot, uh, you know, because mm -hmm. other guys were getting home uh, and he wasn't able to. And, and obviously if you get it on the green, now you have a chance to tie. If you make a putt, it's, it's very hard to hole out, you know? So there's something to that. I think I, I just, 
I just think we're, you know, we might be overanalyzing it to the point where, you know, I, I think he was a little shocked that early, you know, he's, I think on the 11th hole, he still had a two or three shot lead. And all of a sudden, two holes later, he's behind. And now you're, you're totally got to change your mindset. And, Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that, um, you know, that was maybe a little bit unexpected and he wasn't prepared enough to, to adjust. I mean, as you noted, Tiger was pretty good at that. Tiger kept people at bay by not making mistakes. And frankly, they were so accustomed to him not making mistakes that they got aggressive and made mistakes. When actually mm-hmm. Tiger at times did make mistakes, he made some bogeys here and there. He, he, you oh, know, in, in, in except for the majors that he won by a mile, there were times where you know he, we forget he, he lost a final round lead or he fell back, uh, because of mistakes. But other guys, I think, got so um, accustomed to thinking, I can't make any mistakes. I can't make any mistakes. He's not going to make any mistakes. I got to be aggressive. And then when they're aggressive, that's the, that's exactly what played into his hands because inevitably you're going to, you're not going to pull off a shot. You're going to miss a short side of green. Uh, you're going to hit one in a bunker, you know, you're going to three putt, whatever. And, um, and, and the guy who's, who's limiting the mistakes is going to profit from that. Do, do you think Rory leaves St. Andrews bewildered in that he he did everything he was supposed to, and he, he still didn't walk away with what he wanted most? Yeah, this is a good question because what's worse, shooting 80 like he did at the Masters all those years ago when he had a lead, a 54-hole lead? Um, you know, and he was a 54-hole mm-hmm. leader by himself that day uh, and was still leading on the 10th tee and just completely, you know, uh, discombobulated and, and blew the tournament. He finished 15th. He's tied for the lead on the 10th tee, and he finished 15th. You know, he shot over 40 on the mm-hmm. back nine. So is that worse or is this worse where you feel like, God, what do I got to do? You know, I, I think he's probably smart if he recognizes, you know, I, I didn't do a whole lot wrong. I'm, I, I, I'm not going to beat myself up over this. You know, I played a pretty solid round of golf in the last round of a major that most times is going to get it done. And if I just make a putt or two more, everything's different. You know, I mean, if he stays in front um, or at least tied, maybe the way Cam Smith plays those last holes is a little bit more more daunting for him. You know, we, he knew when he got the lead that even if he bogeyed 17, he was still going to be tied and he'd have a chance on 18 to make up for it. Um, maybe it's different if you're trailing. Because um, you know, to give up a bogey on seventeen then becomes becomes uh, you know it becomes problematic. You you got you don't have enough time to make it up. How good was Smith's? Well, well, we'll call it an up and down on seventeen. That that <clears throat> everyone sitting at home at a TV that that doesn't know what that road hole is. How, how good was that up and down or that we will even call it a two putt? Yeah, especially I mean, given the circumstances it was under. Yeah, that what's crazy is is that won't go down as a putt, but it was it was the putt of the tournament. You know, it was the one that put him in position to make a par and make sure he made no worse than bogey. Because, like I said, even if he made mm-hmm. bogey, he would have still just been tied. And while Cam Young was obviously right there and put the pressure on by eagling the last hole, I think it plays out differently if they are. Uh, you know, in the, in the same situation where he's not – Cam Young kind of had to go for it on 18. He was two back. He would have been one back, and now maybe he plays a little bit 18th differently. In other words, I'm saying I'm not sure he makes eagle on 18 like he did when he had really kind of nothing to lose. He was going all out. But back to 17, yeah, I mean, first of all, it was, inc- it was incredibly good course management to do what he did. I mean, I don't know if he considered hitting a – pitch shot or a chip shot there over the bunker you know I'm sort of curious if other players might have you know the way I was looking at it I wasn't thinking that he'd be putting you know you're you're thinking of where the pin is and you're thinking here's the bunker in the way you have to go around the bunker you're not really putting it close to the hole so I'm thinking well what's he going to have left after he hits it on there there's not much room if he's not careful he leaves it in the bunker 
And if he blades it or hits it strong, it's over the green or, or he's got a 40 footer for par. Instead, mm-hmm. he played it around and it came off perfectly. He had like, you know, whatever, eight, 10, 12 feet, 10, 12 feet. And even if he doesn't make it, it's still a great play, you know, but the fact that he did make it just was, you know, icing. It was incredible. And, um, you know, you got to give him a lot of credit. That's that, you know, there's, there's a lot of nerves in play at that point in time. Yeah. And especially on, well, it's, you know, th- th- there you have a hole that's what, 200 years old <laughs> right. estimate ballpark. And, and it's still causing fits, even with modern technology and everything that these guys can do because they can't get to the hole. They've actually kind of tamed that road bunker. I think they needed to restore it. It used to be a little bit more penal. I think they could do that and, and make the hole that much more treacherous. You know, um, uh, you know, there was a great old quote from Ben Crenshaw. You know, he said he said years ago the reason the seventeenth hole is the hardest par four in major championship golf is because it was designed as a par five. And he's right. You know, back in the earlier days of the Open, it was a par five. It wasn't, you know, in terms of like modern times, it wasn't that long ago. Like it might have been a par five as mm-hmm. recently as the sixties. Uh, now it's a par four. You wow. know, you're you're hitting this tee shot basically over the edge of a hotel. It's blind. Uh, you know, you got a railway shed. You know, the tee box is actually now not on the property. It's it's it in theory it's out of bounds. It's not on the boundary of the property. Um, and you've got this hellacious bunker to the left and the road to the right where you get no relief. There's not even relief from the wall um, over there. If it's up against the wall, too bad. So mm-hmm. it's just a very very unique hole and. And it's easy to get, uh, you know, it, it's easy to get off there because there's there's not a lot of bailout and there's not a place a lot of places to hit it. How do you think going forward? Because, what I mean, that last week was a very unique week in that there was basically no wind the entire week, none per se, not not British Open wind. Outside of of there being some wind, and and they seemed to tuck all the pins that they possibly could for every day. It was like eighteen was within the same five foot radius for all four days. How, how do you see them combating modern technology and, and what the way these guys are training now that, that, that doesn't make that course obsolete at some point under the assumption distance continues to improve the way it has over the last number of years? Well, first they did have a little wind, not British open wind, but they mm-hmm. did have some, it was enough to make them think, but it wasn't enough to cause havoc. And to your point about tucking the pins and everything, you know, frankly, if the wind had been completely calm or if it's warmer, even, you know, then, then that 20 under is really in peril. You know, they're going to go lower than that. Mm -hmm. It it was just tricky enough. You know, another thing that can make it easier is if they'd had a wet summer and the ground was softer, it wasn't, it was hard as a rock. The ball was running, bouncing, you know, Stuart sink had a great line. He said, you know, it's 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 just how they would like a, a, a firm, fast links. It's like there's nothing to stop the ball other than a bunker or rough. And that means you gotta really be on. You've got to be able to control it because when it's softer, it's it's not gonna roll out. You know, you might not run into the bunkers or into the rough. In this case, you were going to you really had to be um, on top of how far you were hitting it and understanding the bounces and everything because too many times you can hit it too good. So in that regard, it, 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 it will hold up like it did this past week if you have firm conditions and if they elect mm-hmm. to put the pins in some tough spots. Where they're <clears throat> going to run into trouble is a year that it's soft and there's no wind, like zero, which can happen. You know, it can be a perfectly flat, calm day there. Uh, it's not it's not normal, but it happens. Then then it will get it'll get annihilated. And then are we going to be OK with that? You know, if it's it, it, you know, and some people will say it was too easy now. You had all those people under par. I mean, uh, you know, the cut was even, um, which is sort of unusual in a major. It's usually over par. Uh, so um, uh, but. But the fact that I think it held up again is is a good sign, and we'll see. It's going to be five, six more years before they're back, and you'd hate to see the old course, you know, get to a point where 
it's just not hard enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you. The only thing I mean, I, I'm not familiar with. <clears throat> I've never played there, and I'm obviously familiar with the famous holes. But like the only things I could think on like 17 is maybe they put a, a gathering of uh, pot bunkers in the left rough so that it it, for, it puts a premium on some accuracy on that hole. Otherwise, you're pitching out, right? You you hit it in one of those pot bunkers left of the fairway where the miss was because if you, obviously you miss right, you're out of bounds. Um, it, it it is a at least a half, if not a full shot penalty. I, I, I mean, th there's much smarter people that like, a, you know, they do at Augusta where they measure every single shot to figure right. out what they need to do to the course. I'm sure at some point they're going to do that at these older famous courses for their rotation. Um, but it, it, it's an interesting thing to, to watch play out, especially as it's accelerated the last couple of years. Sure. I mean, they're, they're, I'm not sure what the answer is because they are criticized for growing the left, the rough down the left side of 17. There's some people who would prefer to not mm -hmm. see high rough and let the ball run because if it runs too far, now your angle is bad. You can bail out over there and miss the hotel and not worry about all that, but you're going to be way left. And now you're having to hit over that bunker. You're not, it's harder to run it up. Uh, so, you know, sometimes there's something to be said for, um, letting the ball go. This is, this is the same issue at Augusta. You know, when they grew up their rough a little bit, when they let there be more pine straw or more obstacles off the fairway, what it did was it kept the ball from rolling into trouble. You know, the more it runs, the, the more chance it has to, to be worse. And so um, it's an interesting dilemma in the game, frankly. You know, and when you start messing with What's been there for a long time, you're going to open yourself up to some criticism. Um, and I'm not sure what the right answer is. You know, I will say this. The hole really did play pretty, pretty tough uh, overall. I mean, it was the hardest of the week. Um, I think I saw something where like on Saturday, only eight or nine percent of the field hit the green in two. Yeah, you know? that was going to say that. I mean, you're looking at it on Sunday. You got Cameron Young and Rory hitting. Would they hit nine iron in there? Uh, right. Young might have hit wedge. And, and so you've got most of the field hitting lower to mid iron into that green that's angled away from you, sloping away. And if you work the ball a little too much one way or the other, or if it does, you know, if you're bringing it in right to left and it doesn't work enough, now you're, well, am I going to be up against the wall? Right. Any relief? It, and I mean, part of, part of that is due to the fact that the, um, uh, you know, the wind, the small amount of wind was helping. Um, it was helping, uh, you know, kind of off, off their right shoulders. So they were able to, um, you know, they were able to get some benefit out of that. And that's why you had those short irons in, you know, if the wind is hurting them a little bit there, uh, you know, which, which would have meant downwind on the outward holes, um, perhaps it makes it even more so, but yet even with that, that was a prevailing win for most of the tournament. Even with that, they still had a hard time hitting that green on during the third round, given where that mm -hmm. pin was and given given the difficulties of the hole in general. Yeah, I, I would hate, and, and anybody would hate to see anything happen to to St Andrews where it's it does not become part. I, I don't I don't think the bot the ruling bodies as much as they're they have gotten negativity thrown at them for some of their decisions in the past uh, where they've been late to the game where they've dilly dally too long the distance debate they appeared to be dragging their feet a little bit but you would hate to see, see anything happen to being St. Andrews being removed from that and I don't think they're going to let that happen not not the iconic course that that is right you certainly hope not <laughs> yeah today's world you never need nothing right. surprising anymore there is no no normal i don't they might want to remove it from wikipedia or the webster's dictionary because i don't <laughs> think there is a definition of normal anymore uh, i i do want to touch you brought up tiger in, in his talks with rory and, and you have a fair amount of research on tiger g given your book tiger and phil um i want to talk about that a little bit because it was interesting as i was reading i i didn't realize i knew you wrote the book and i i do have it on order so everyone you get on amazon and um I, I, I would recommend it just by reading some of the excerpts and, and you know, Rick Riley promoted it for you and, and a lot of very good people. What, <laughs> I mean, I, back, you, you wrote it, started researching that about 20 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. 
Well, I don't. I didn't start researching the book then. I pro- I didn't really come have an idea for the book until after Tiger won the Masters. But I mean, I've been there for all of their him and Tiger and Phil's major wins. So there's a lot of built mm-hmm. up knowledge and and um, and and sort of history and you know, a lot of things I've written that I could reference and you know things I've noted over the years that obviously made the project. I don't want to say it was easy, but it made it easier for me, you know, because because having been at all of these things, it's it's sort of, you know, it's you know, while you might not remember all the details, you kind of have a sense of how good they both were. So, uh, but the actual the actual project itself didn't sort of formulate until Three, you know, a little, well, three years ago now, basically, when when Tiger won the the 2019 Masters, it just it just seemed to me like there was something there, and and Phil had been the 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 longest running protagonist, and and uh, obviously, other than Tiger, above everybody else for all that time, and it felt like the right way to approach to approach a project like that. So. Uh, um, but yeah, for both guys, I go way back with them in terms of being around when they did stuff. When, when it, when it's so heavily sided in favor of one player versus the other it is, can you still call it a rivalry? Yeah, it's a fair and, point. And I'm saying that without, I haven't read the book yet, but I, I, you might speak to that in the book, but j- just for, before we get to that. I, I, it's a fair point and one I address in the book. I mean, you can certainly make, make the argument that Tiger had no rival, that his rival was history mm-hmm. or his rival was Jack Nicholas, or, you know, uh, but, but I think, you know, the, the, you know, the subtitle golf's most fascinating rivalry. I mean, I think, I think it's nuanced, you know, and I've tried to use other sports to, to point out how, Rivalries can be one-sided, but that doesn't mean they're not rivalries. Take Ohio State and Michigan in football. You know, this mm-hmm. past year, Michigan finally beat Ohio State, what, for the first time in seven or eight years. My guess is is that Ohio State doesn't look at Michigan as any less of a rival just because they've beat them all those years. Um, the Cubs-Cardinals in baseball is another one. You know, the Cardinals have way more World Series than the Cubs do. But they're rivals, you know. They when they get together, mm-hmm. it matters. The Bears and the Packers is another one. The Packers have pretty much owned the Bears for twenty years. But <laughs> but you know, the, right. I, I don't think that the Bear, I don't think that Green Bay looks at Chicago any less differently. So you know, this is kind of the same way. I mean, Tiger clearly viewed Phil. He might not have let on, but he clearly viewed Phil as a threat. He kept him at arm's length. He didn't mind dissing him once in a while. There was some pettiness between them. Uh, there was some acrimony at times. Um, frankly, you know, maybe a little childishness. Nothing was was egregious. Nothing was horrible, but it was just there, you know. And they weren't going to be buddies. And they were certainly in the case of Tiger towards Phil. He was going to maybe enjoy it when Phil was was down. You know, Phil was a lot mm-hmm. more complimentary towards Tiger, and he he decided to take what I thought was was a good tact. He he kind of praised him for being so good and helping make him better. And while he said, "I wondered what my career would be like if he weren't around," I also know that maybe I wouldn't have worked as hard because I knew how hard I had to work to try and beat him. And, you know, Phil had his moments. Phil did have his moments with Tiger. You know, his British Open win in 2013, Tiger was one of the guys he beat. He came from behind to win. Uh, 2010 Masters, Tiger was right there. Tiger dearly wanted the 06 Masters as his dad was dying, actually died Mm -hmm. a month later, and Phil won. So, you know, it, it, it was very, very lopsided early on, and... It took a while for Phil to get the hang of it. And when he did, the major total was seven to six. You know, starting when Phil won the Masters in 04, from that point on, uh, Tiger won seven. And his last one was 
2019, and Phil won six with which is with his last one last year. So um, uh, from that standpoint, you know that's my argument for why you do have to sort of recognize the rivalry, um, even if the record is not quite. Uh, what you might think it should be for there to be such an intense rivalry. You know, the other thing is, is they, they didn't go head to head enough, you know, Mm -hmm. which is an unfortunate byproduct of, of the way golf works. Part of that had to do with the PJ tour almost never paired them together in the first two rounds of a tournament, like virtually, you know, less than a handful of times over 20 plus years, they put them on for the TV ratings. They wanted them on opposite sides of the draw. Definitely. They put them on opposite sides, almost the exact tee times in reverse. So you knew like Tiger had the morning tee time on Thursday. Phil had the exact morning tee time on Friday and vice versa. And so not only are they not playing together for the first two rounds, but the fact that you come together on the weekend based on score makes it a lot harder for them to get paired together because unless there's separation, there's going to be a bunch of players at the same number and there's no chance that you'd be put together because it's based on first in last out. You know, whoever finishes first mm-hmm. on Friday is going to go out later on Saturday and all the way down. That's, that's how they do the pairings. And so it made for less of an opportunity for them to play together on the weekends, you know? So, um, you know, those, those instances were rare, but they were in the mix together at a lot of tournaments, even if they weren't playing together. And, uh, you know, I try to highlight some of those epic ones um, and, uh, and try to capture, you know, people who were there and, 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 and the scene and, and, and who did what. Um, and, uh, and, and certainly, you know, other aspects to their careers, which are many. Yeah, I remember one of the first memorable head to heads they had was at Doral that year mm-hmm. when when and I think leading into it, Phil made the comment that he was hitting it longer than tiger and tiger hated it. Um, <laughs> and I can't remember, maybe you, you, you might, cause you were probably there on what was it? The, there's the long par five where the, the drive it's on the back nine, it's like 13 or 15 and it, it's just a run dead straight one runway. So you can, you can go after it as hard as you want to. And I think tiger knocked it by him about 10 or 15 and everyone was kind of saying, well, maybe Phil shouldn't, spout or spew so much uh it seems like he irritated tiger a little bit but would you say that that was kind of the one of the bigger rival not rivalry but the what everyone was kind of hoping to see more often no question well first of all i, I did an entire chapter on on Doral. that was in 05 mm-hmm. that frankly was their best duel ever of any of them majors whatever that was the best one the, um, the comment you're talking about that Phil made was made a couple of years earlier. And he okay. actually meant it to be a compliment, I think. And it came out as dissing Tiger. You know, he hates that I hit it by him now. And he said, you know, he's doing this with inferior equipment. Nike was furious that he said that. But what he, <laughs> but what he, meant, what he meant was is at the time, Tiger was playing with a shorter shafted driver. A lot of guys had gone to a 44-inch driver, some 44 and a half. Tiger was still mm-hmm. playing a 43 and a half inch driver with, you know, basically regular metal. Some guys had gone to different um, materials in their in their shafts of their drivers, and they were using bigger headed drivers, and they were hitting it farther because of it. And Tiger was still using some of the stuff that he had used to win like he had won. And why would you change when you're so successful with it anyway? Tiger has always been one who was slow to make equipment changes. He was going to work it out first. You know, he was going to take his time. Mm -hmm. Um, They're both, they're both equipment geeks. You know, they both like to test and fiddle and mess around. And Tiger might've done that for months with something and still kept his other stuff in the bag. So, I don't think Phil meant it the way it came out. Um, it caused quite the little controversy. Like there, there had to be an apology and, you know, Tiger came out and said something. Nike was upset. Um, but it, it, in the actuality, he had a point. Tiger was not using technology to, his, to, to the fullest yet, but yet he was still winning. I mean, 
We're talking about comments that were made in 2003 and in 2002, Tiger won, won two majors and, and finished second in the PGA and had a storm blow away his chances of winning the British Open at Muirfield. So it's not like he mm-hmm. was suffering because the equipment that he was using was, was so bad. Uh, so, and then as far as 05 Doral, you, you, the whole year talked about is the 12th and it's a par five, uh, 10 and 12 at Doral are par fives. And I, in the, in the final round, Phil had a lead and Tiger finally overhauled him when he eagled the 12th and he actually went ahead and everybody figured it was over. You know, he, he hauled down Phil, he came from behind, you know, he got ahead of him, but Phil stepped up and tied him you know, and, and the closing holes and they were tied until, until the 17th hole when, 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 uh, when, when Tiger was able to get, get a, a, a longer birdie putt to drop. And, but the, the atmosphere was, was off the charts. I mean, it was, it was like a heavyweight fight. Um, the, 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 the vibe was so intense and so good. And the two of them really thrived on it. And it came right down to 18. I mean, Phil nearly chipped in to tie from right off the green and Tiger still had to knock in a four footer to win by a shot. Um, and you know, there was even a good little aftermath of, about it. You know, Ty, uh, Phil at the time, it was sponsored by Ford. It was the Ford Doral mm-hmm. championship. Tiger of course was with Buick. The winner gets a Ford. Tiger wasn't going to be caught dead in a Ford. So he gave it to his caddy, Steve Williams. It was like a really nice Ford I, uh, of some sort. And, and, and Steve Williams couldn't resist a, a little jab at Phil by saying he sort of made fun of his girth saying, you wouldn't fit in this car very well. It's much better than I'm getting it. <laughs> and I think it was a little bit more harsh than that. But anyway, I mean, the rivalry kind of extended to the caddy. It's not so much bones on Phil's side, but. Steve Williams and Phil didn't get along real well. And that's, that's a lot of that's in the book too. Uh, yeah. I, I can't wait to get it. I've got it at, uh, in Amazon um, in my cart right now. And I, I only, haven't ordered it. I think I've reached out to you what, a few, almost a few days back. I, I didn't order it yet. Cause I, my girlfriend's got a few things she wants and shipped at the same time or I would have had it and read already before you came on. But uh, it, it's, it's fun to hear some pieces. It makes me even more excited mm-hmm. and hopefully people listening to, to go out and get it and check it out. You know, w- one thing I always said about the, the differences in Tiger and Phil outside of what was obvious was to me, Tiger seemed somewhat polarizing in that a lot of the older golf establishment, and you can put whatever reason you want to, would watch to see him fail. It, but the, a, a larger portion watched to see him win in, in his pursuit of history, whereas Phil half watched him to see if he would win, but the other half watched to say there's a 50-50 chance that he's going to do something really dumb. <laughs> or, or, right, or, or, or if he had a four- to six-footer, that there's a 50-50 chance that he's going to miss this. And, and I know you got some geeks out there that are going to say, oh, yeah, from four or six feet, the you know, tour pros are you know, 60% or whatever it is anyway. But my point is, Tiger, you would expect to make the four to, to six footer. Phil, you're you're wondering, is he even going to hit the hole? Sometimes he's either going to make it that center or he's going to miss the hole completely. And and it was like their dynamic was just completely different on people watching them, as well as their personalities and how they approach the game. As someone who who followed them and and rode on them and watched them, what, was it is that somewhat close or what was it different? No, that's that's a good observation. That's another part of it that I think is interesting is they were completely different players. You know, there's there's mm-hmm. a perception that Tiger obviously hit it a long way, bold, aggressive. Tiger Tiger was only aggressive in spots. He played very conservative golf. You know, he he I think we we think of him differently because he missed a lot of fairways. But he didn't miss them because he was being, you know, trying to be bold. He just missed them. You know, it was, it was the part of the game that as he as he continued to evolve, got worse in terms of keeping it in play. Some of that has to do with the equipment. When you have a longer shaft and a bigger mm-hmm. head, the ball's going to go farther and it's going to be harder to keep it in play. And Tiger wasn't willing to give up the distance to keep it to keep it straight. So he sacrificed to hit it out there and he missed a lot more fairways. I mean, it, you know, at one point in time, Tiger was like 65, 66 percent in fairways hit. 
which is pretty good for a long hitter, and it dropped down into the low 50s. Now, he was still winning doing that, but he was making it harder on himself. Phil was never mm -hmm. much Yeah, he wasn't than... winning by six and seven anymore. No, I mean, you know, those big wins were, you know, early, early on, you know. And so uh, mm -hmm. Phil was always a wild driver. And what that led to is him taking chances in places where he needed to be, needed to be more cautious. And Phil developed this, this mantra of being go for broke. I mean, Phil was Arnold Palmer and Tiger was Jack Nicholas. You know, Arnold was a guy who liked to be bold and take chances. And sometimes it really cost him. Uh, whereas Jack would hit it to the middle of the green and, you know, he would take his two putts. But if you hit it to the middle of the green often enough, you're going to have some short ones too. That's how he looked at it. Mm -hmm. If I don't miss the green on the wrong, in the wrong spot, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to be too far off. And Tiger kind of played that way. So they were completely different in that regard. You know, Tiger was, was more conservative. Phil went for broke a lot. And early in his career, he used to get criticized for it. Um, and frankly, when he, when he tempered it a little bit is when he, is when he succeeded. There are times certainly playing bold helped him. The, the uh, 2010 at the Masters, you know, on 13, when he threaded the needle through those, through those trees and knocked it on the green. You know, his caddy bones wanted him to lay up. As it turned out, Phil missed that eagle putt. But still, it set up an easy birdie. And if you if you lay it up, there's no guarantee mm -hmm. you're going to hit it that close. That but that was a bit risky. You know, he could have hit a tree limb there, or you know, it's, it's, you know, six iron from 200 plus yards. Not exactly an easy shot to pull off with water in front. You know, depending on the circumstances, Tiger probably doesn't hit that shot. And so that's where they were. They were they were on the opposite ends of that, uh, which I think again sort of makes their whole relationship rivalry all that more compelling because they went at it different completely different ways yeah you know if you take the phil's biggest blunder self-admittedly the the open it at, at winged foot um when he botched the last hole what, what amazed me at at that time is it's easy sitting here in my chair watching it on tv not under the pressure or anything else but what i would and i say that because it, leading up to that time that, that was when Mickelson had got with Dave Pels, and they did a lot of work on his wedge mm -hmm. game, uh, his putting and everything. And Phil's wedge game was as good as it had ever been at that point. And, and my whole theory on that was, okay, you're one of the best wedge players on the PGA Tour and arguably in the world. You hit a bad shot. I know it's the final hole of the, of the U.S. Open. Punch out somewhere to wedge distance, and you're going to make no worse than five. Because you're so, and you're probably going to, there's a good chance you're going to make four, your talent level, your, your ability, your new, newly developed skill, a litany of things. And the fact that he tried to hit that career shot, it's like, I mean, it speaks to what you said, his swashbuckling mantra that developed over that time. I, I would have bet everything I had if Tiger was in that position, hit to drive that crooked, that he would have somehow found a way to get that ball in the fairway where he gave himself another chance. It's an excellent point. Phil had lost two majors to guys who did the exact same thing that he wouldn't do. In 99, the U.S. Open, Payne mm -hmm. Stewart missed the fairway on 18 at Pinehurst, punched it out, got up and down with a wedge from 100 and some yards. David Tom's 2001 PGA, you know, Phil, that week, Phil shot the lowest 72-hole score of anybody in PGA Tour championship history except the guy who beat him, David Toms. And David Toms, same thing. He made a par after having to hit a wedge onto the green. So here it is in 06. Like you said, Phil's an outstanding wedge player. Certainly from 100 yards, that's a shot that's right in his wheelhouse. But on a hole previous to that, he had pulled off a similar shot around a tree. Phil drove the ball horribly that day. He probably had no business. What, he hit like the, three fairways? Yeah, I think it was two. I think it was only two, and it's mm -hmm. amazing that he was leading with that. You know, he was just a wizard with the rest of his game. The guy who played with him that day, a guy named Kenneth Ferry, an English an English guy, shot seventy six, and you know, he said, I, I I I don't remember exactly what Phil's final score was that day, but but he said, I wouldn't have broken eighty hitting it where Phil hit it that day. And yet he came to the last mm -hmm. hole leading 
and I would have bet a lot of money that he would have just punched it out there and tried to hit a wedge to get it up and down. And again, that kind of just speaks to his mindset. Obviously, if you can pull that shot off and get it on the green, you've got an easy, fairly easy two putt to win. But uh, of course, he hit it into that tree, and now he had, you know, it was a nightmare. And and you know, I guess w- what you what I would say to that is is a guy like that never even considers he's going to hit it into the tree. You know, he probably is not. It's not even on his mind. He's like, no, I'm going to pull this off. But but obviously he did, and and he made a disastrous double bogey and never won the U.S. Open. What what do you think Phil did in his game or in his life or wherever it came from that allowed him starting in, in that in the two thousand five six range to to make that catch up to Tiger? Was was it Tiger kind of going through his swing changes and his physical issues? Was it something that Phil did in his game? Was it a, a change maybe that that you saw as, as being front row uh, to the entire? movie so to speak uh, he, well what, what he, did you see that 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 made that change part of it was he had an attitude adjustment in 2003 his wife um amy their third child uh who was their son evan who would now be what he would be 20 21 years old uh no 19 mm-hmm. something 19 i think he is um they almost died in childbirth his wife and his son nearly died and it was like in March of 2003. It was a very, very difficult pregnancy, and it was obviously very upsetting and and eye opening for Phil. And at the time, you know, he had a horrible season. He didn't win that year. He was kind of going through the motions. Um, as we've come to learn later, he he had some gambling issues back then. He sort of vowed to clean that up. He vowed to get better, and he got working with a trainer. In the off season, he got in better shape. He lost some weight. Um, he got with his his coach Rick Smith, um, who you know they worked through some things. Obviously, you mentioned Dave Pell's the short game, and you know he came right out mm-hmm. early in two thousand and four, and he won what used to be called the Bob Hope in in Palm Springs, and and that kind of set him on his and, way. And put on a, dis- a wedge display. Yeah, yeah, he put a wedge display on at that tournament. He, you know, he just kind of. He kind of found it and he got some confidence and he started playing with more, you know, with more discipline too, you know, and, and, uh, and in 04, um, you know, he, he found a way to hit more fairways uh, at Augusta. And yet when it came time to, to be the old Phil, he was that way on the 12th hole on Sunday, you know, Ernie Ells was leading him, and, you know, Phil knew I, I really need a birdie here. And that's not a hole where you typically try to make birdie on Sunday. Uh, Mm -hmm. But he, you know, he hit one right over the flag um, uh, out to the left. He didn't flirt with the creek. Phil's done that before, too, and come up short, made the birdie putt. I mean, he he got back into the tournament and gave himself a chance and obviously made the great birdie on on 18. And now that's that gives him confidence. Right. He went to Shinnecock that year. Played in the final group with Retief Goosen, was leading late until he made a double bogey on 17, in which, <laughs> you know, t- to his misfortune, there was a rock right behind his ball in the bunker, you know, and it just made that. for a tough bunker shot, and he ended up making double. Uh, that that summer at Royal Troon, um, he missed a playoff by a shot. It was his best open finish ever. He had never done anything at the open. He never was able to play that style of golf, Lynx golf, uh, and and yet he almost he almost got in a playoff there, and it, and at the at the PGA he was right in the mix as well. I, I believe he tied for sixth and missed a playoff by two, at Whistling Straits. That's the one that VJ Singh won in a playoff over Demarco. So there's four mm-hmm. majors he contends in all of them. He could have easily won two or three. Tiger's nowhere to be seen that year. He was not. Uh, he was going through his swing change then. He didn't really contend in any of those majors, and so I think that doubly gave Phil confidence. You know, look, I was there. Tiger wasn't. I won one. He didn't. And now all of a sudden it starts to change a little bit. Now, of course, the very next year Tiger wins the Masters uh, right out. He won at St Andrews that year as well. But Phil won the PGA. 
you know, and then Phil won the Masters the following spring and should have won the U.S. Open to give him three in a row, which is only Tiger had done. So that was sort of the period there from about 04 to 09, where the two of those guys were really at their, you know, sort of at their competitive zenith between them. You know, I, I remember when Tiger came out, and, and I don't know this for certain. I'd have to ask somebody like Noda or, or Conrad Ray, who played with him in college. But I can remember when Tiger came out, and, and at that time, a lot of college guys, because this was when I was the, the, there. Tiger's, I think, three years younger than I am. So this was when I was trying to play. And I, I would notice that he would miss a fair amount, in particular the wedges, short-sided. And I, I remember – he and Butch worked a lot on, on their wedge because Tiger had a lot of forward shaft lean and was coming in de-lofted. But they worked a lot on that. But what I also noticed was Tiger did was not – when he went on, on – when he started to get going on his run and started to win a lot, he was not missing short side anymore. I, and I, I had the assumption that, that Butch got with him and said, look, I know maybe in junior golf and college this is what you had to do to, to try to compete with the guys who are older than you. But on the PGA Tour, if you're going to have a long career, you're going to start short-siding yourself. You're going to put a lot of stressor on, stressing your, in your system. And over the period of, of career, you're going to burn yourself out. Let's maybe look at it this way. And, I, I, you know, the, the, the story that Phil or Butch tell were when they were together and Butch said, don't let Tiger put out because then you're going to have to deal with all the noise of the crowd moving. I, I just I'm curious to know if anybody would know that which gave him some other things that allowed him to feel more confident and step his game up in, in those situations that he needed to. I don't think there's any question. Um, you know, Butch started working with Phil in 2007, and Phil immediately won the Players' Championship on a course where he had had no success and really hasn't had any since. Um, but he won it, like, mm -hmm. within a month of them starting together. And... You know, he had some decent success through that time. He didn't win any majors until the 2010 Masters. But he did teach Tiger, or excuse me, Phil a few tricks. You know, one of, one of them was what you said. You know, like, if, if Tiger had somebody that he was really, you know, trying to bear down on, he would, he would, uh, he would putt out so that, all the crowd would scurry because he knew how it was. A lot of people would just take off when he was done. When Tiger was being considerate to his playing partners, which I would say is a majority of the time, you know, it was only in the heat of the moment that mm -hmm. he would do that. But he would he would mark so that the other guy could putt and then Tiger would putt out last because he knows what a commotion it would cause when he was done, you know. So – and there was a few other things I think that he taught Phil best to deal with Tiger. It might have had to do with, you know, walking onto the tee last. You know, let Tiger go up there first so that you're not standing there when he walks up and everybody's howling, hollering for him or, you know, cheering for him so loudly. Let you go last. Let them do that first and then let them cheer for you when you walk onto the tee. Just little mm -hmm. things like that that probably helped him mentally. That, um, you know, that Butch had been with Tiger since he was 16, you know, all the way through 2002. And there's a lot of conjecture as to why they ever split up, you know, and if, had, if he'd have stayed with them, what might have happened? I always argue that, you know, Hank Haney, for whatever reason, caught a lot of grief, but boy, they had a good record together, too. You know, so um, uh, somewhat unfair, I think, that, that Hank caught all that grief. I mean, yeah, his swing was a lot different, but. You know, Tiger won six majors under Hank. You know, mm -hmm. nothing, nothing to be upset about. He's far more consistent, actually, under Hank. Well, way more top tens. Uh, didn't have the wide disparity in finishes. He content from 05 through 09. I mean, Tiger was just, you know, amazing record during that time. And I think he won 31 times on tour during that stretch. Ridiculous. So. Um, it's sort of another tribute to Tiger that he was able to do it. You know, he's been successful basically with four different coaches throughout his pro career. And, and um, <laughs> you know, that's another thing I think that he'll, he'll, he'll long be remembered for. That's, that's pretty unusual. That, that's why one of the things I say, because my brother worked for Hank at the International Academy, um, and he used to say that. And I, 
back then the, the thing that I said, and this was not anti Hank, this was just, uh, in my opinion, I said, okay, but you also have a s- very seasoned Tiger Woods at that point in his career. And th- I mean, this is really splitting hairs as mm-hmm. far as did, did he play better under Butcher Tiger? So you've got a, an, an, an older, more experienced Tiger. Um, d- did he play better because his swing was better, or did he play better because he knew how to? Number one, manage his, his himself better, his own emotions and everything else as, as he was aging. And did he know the courses better? And, and I, I just that, that's I'm not trying to debate anybody. That those are just things that go through my mind as as I try to r- really dive into some things that people take for granted. Well, he did this under Butch and this under Hank. I'm like, okay, but here's some of the differences. That's a great point. I mean, Tiger. I think sir- they're both very good teachers. T- Tiger was a was a very very successful player at that point, who knew his swing better, and probably knew how to handle things a little bit better than when he was younger, you know. And what Hank was working mm-hmm. with him on was quite a bit different than what he did with Butch, and you could argue what was better. I mean, one of the reasons he went to Hank was to try to protect his knee, you know, what what he was doing with Butch you know, put a lot of pressure on the left knee. What he did with Hank, not as much. Even though the knee surgery came under Hank, it was due to years and years of obviously, um, you know, built up stress on that left leg. And, um, you know, that that action that Tiger had where he would, you know, kind of stand up on the left side through the ball, I mean, took its toll on his left knee over the years. And he didn't do that Mm -hmm. quite as much with Hank and a lot of people didn't like his swing under Haney. They thought it was, it was you know completely different and 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 gave him a different ball flight. But you know, uh, I mean, not being someone who is you know trained in that sort of thing myself, I just I kind of look at the results. And and you know he, I sure some of it comes from his 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 experience, his guile. He knew the golf course is better. Um, he he probably improved his short game, you know, and Hank used to always say um, in Phil, in fact, would to this day that when Tiger struggled the most, it wasn't due to his swing being off so much as it was as he got older, he didn't putt as well. And avoiding three putts was huge. Uh, And he had more of those as he got on. And when he could have, when he could have a tournament with fewer three putts, he almost always contended. And, Hank yeah, used to, to, to the bemoan the fact. You made when, when, yeah, I was just saying Hank when, used to when, bemoan when the fact it, that he got he sometimes caught grief for Tiger swing not being in sync, and yet he would often point to yeah, but he he three putted six times during this tournament. If you limit that to two, that's four shots that he gave away. And you know now, could you argue that maybe he hit it in spots that he shouldn't have? Sure, but I, I I'm guessing he did that under the old swing too. It happened so. Anyway, it's just kind of interesting how that all played out. And, and you know, I just choose to look at it as, as no matter who it was, Tiger eventually figured it out and had great success, even with Sean Foley. You know, I mean, he didn't win a major under Sean, but, you know, he won he won nine times worldwide, including the um, the tournament at Sherwood, the, the unofficial tournament. In, in, in 2011, in 12, he won three. In 13, he won five, including the players. He, you know, he won a, he won two WGCs. It's a heck of a year, and but yet he was being criticized because he didn't win a major. So um, under Sean, he did very you well know, for himself too. I, ha- <clears throat> I had a, a, a very interesting theory on Tiger's. I call it his his swing search journey. Uh, I had this discussion with uh, Dan Hellman, who was he. He, Dan was rumored to be Tiger's physical therapist and trainer when Tiger made his comeback uh, mm-hmm. through his back surgery. And I tried to get Dan admitted on the show and, and he, he's like, he, he's not, he, if he was, he's not allowed, but I, he does have a sign master's flag in his studio from Tiger to say, thanks for all your help. So I, I'm, I'm going to assume that, that Dan was his trainer uh, and therapist. But one thing that, that I talked about with Dan, because outside of being a, a great trainer and therapist, uh, Dan is, a holistic practitioner. He's he was one of Paul Check's twelve worldwide instructors. But I said, Dan, I, I, you would understand this as well as anybody. If you look at when after Earl Woods passed, 
because Earl provided a lot of structure in Tiger's life. Obviously, as anybody who who had a great dad, that, that that's what they do. And after Earl was gone, that was lacking, I think, in Tiger's life. And if you look at his his uh, journey of coaches, he went to Sean, who was extremely structured at that time, very very scientific and numbers related. And then as he said, he left Sean and he went to to Chris, who who understands the biomechanics and everything, but he's not as technically oriented. And then as he they went through their period, and then he kind of went on his own as he made that full circle. You know, when he won the Masters a couple years ago, he, he was working. Mm -hmm. He just had a set of eyes that would keep an eye on him, and that was it. So it t to me, he made that full circle. Right. And not only did he did his was his swing healed, but I think internally his his spiritual or his psyche had healed from the loss of his dad. That 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 was my opinion on that whole scenario. There's no question that his dad's death had an impact on him that I think will be hard for us to ever gauge unless he comes comes through and talks about it himself, you know, in a mm -hmm. memoir or what have you, because, you know, there's been plenty of speculation uh, that it led to the issues of 2009. You know, his dad died in 06, and a couple of years later is when he was embroiled in in, in controversy and his dad was not there to, to, you know, to sort of, I don't know, talk him out of it or make sure that he went down the right road. Uh, and, and his behavior got reckless, you know, and, and so he, it, in some parts of it, it had to do with his game too. I mean, his dad was sort of his putting coach. He, he relied on him to give him tips about putting and now that was gone. And so, you know, to that point mm -hmm. I was making that Hank, you know, in Hank's time is when Tiger's putting deteriorated just a little bit. You know, he, he um, and obviously he still had great success. He, he won, uh, you know, two majors in 06. He won uh, the PJ in 07. He had that great win at the U.S. Open in 08. But he let one get away in 09. And, 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 and you know, actually you could say, too, he had a great chance at the U.S. Open that year where he finished sixth. Um, and then when he came back from the scandal, he just wasn't quite the same. You know, it, it took a while for him to regain that, that uh, whatever it was that he lost. So there's a lot going on there, I think. You know, a lot, a lot that's been sort of speculated on but never really determined as to how might those things have impacted his, his game and his life. Mm -hmm. You know, it, um. I want to get into a little bit about live since that seems to be the, the, the big topic across the golf world. And, and you, 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 in your position and with your experience, you obviously come into contact with a lot of different people and I'm sure get a lot of different perspectives. Um, so like thoughts on live, what, what is, uh, what do you think about it? Is, uh, is, is it, is the PGA tour doing the right thing in their approach or they, could they do it different? What, 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 what are some of your thoughts on, on that whole scenario. Yeah, listen, my, I've, <clears throat> since this has all become a thing, I've just worked really, really hard to understand both sides and, and try to get mm -hmm. a sense for why this has happened, what one side's doing, what the other side's doing. I understand the criticisms. I understand why people think live is great, you know, and really is. It's, I've not really come across anything that's quite as polarizing as this. Tiger's been polarizing at times. I think this is more so. Um, then, you know, you've got obviously the Saudi influence with the funding, which, which I think is another story into itself, because even if it were somebody else funding it, that, that we are okay with, there would Elon still... Elon Musk and five of his billionaire buddies. Sure. If they did it. I, if I asked Mark, people, how would that change? If it were Mark Cuban, if it were Bill Gates, if it were a billionaire that was willing to commit 10 billion to this, uh, over the next 10 years, it would still be controversial. The Saudi mm -hmm. aspect makes it more so, and it makes them an easy target for anybody who thinks that we shouldn't associate with them. And I completely get that side. I understand the argument there, but I try to look at more, how did we get in this position? Because again, I go back to, it could have been anybody putting up the money. And it was probably inevitable that somebody was going to do this at some point. And the major reason we are in this position, you know, th this didn't just crop up overnight. There's been talk of a rival entity, a rival tour that wanted to play 54 whole events with the top 48 players going back six, eight years. 
and it really came to fruition uh, kind of late in uh, 19 and into right before the pandemic. So the PGA Tour knew this was out there. And, and the, the bottom line is, the reason this is a thing is there's no guaranteed money in golf. In pro golf, there's no guaranteed money. You make what you earn, which is noble, but not realistic in this society, in this, in this entertainment world. George Clooney doesn't make a movie and wait to see what the box office receipts are before he's paid. But that's what golfers do. Mm-hmm. You know, They show up and bring a lot of value and sell tickets and hospitality and TV packages, but unless they perform, they don't, they don't get paid. And there's been enough agents and players who've, who've had it presented to them that you know, your, your guys aren't getting what they're worth, that these things had a chance to, to, to take off. Now, the live stuff with the huge guaranteed money, I don't think anybody saw that coming. They've overpaid because it was going to just go away if they didn't do that. It could have possibly been thwarted if the PJ Tour had come up with a plan that allowed for some guaranteed money and had some alternative events that would be under their umbrella. You know, I'm not sure they're thrilled with these 54 hole event ideas, but they could have done some sort of thing where they had smaller fields, had a team component, had six or eight of those tournaments that were part of the schedule, guaranteed guys money to play in them made it competitive to get in them um, and kept their same structure. And, uh, and, and that I don't think anybody wanted to really break away, but when you're talking about the kind of money that we're talking about, how can you not, you know? So I think that's why we're at this point. I'm not sure the tour's idea of suspending guys is working. You know, we've had more and more people go over Um, Mm -hmm. the live enterprise can be patient. They have a lot of money. People kind of scoff at you know some of the players who've signed up. Oh, that guy doesn't move the needle. I mean, they just signed Charles Howell, who's 42 years old, a great guy, a great pro, made a lot of money over the years, not winning a lot. But Charles Howell isn't being brought on to, to sell tickets now to get. He's being brought on to show how much money a guy in his position can make, and guys who are used to beating him are going to look at that and go, "Wait a minute." He's just made $5 million in prize money, finishing 10th or 8th every week, and I've been kicking his butt for all these years, and I'm struggling to make, you know, what, one-fifth of that? And so it gets them thinking, well, maybe mm-hmm. I'll go do it. So Liv has been pretty shrewd in the way they've approached this. Um, the team concept has also been ridiculed. They see that as a way to make money. They, they see these teams as being franchises. And you're starting to see now there's teams, there's like national teams. There's, there's an England team and there's a South African team and they're trying to put together a Japanese right. team. I, not, and, now that they're getting more. And I, I heard Adidas offered a bit or might be offering a billion dollars for one of the teams. I mean, I don't know. I don't if, know. That's hearsay right now. I don't know if that's the number, but you know, the number will be significant and there will be more people like that, that would get in. It could be a big businessman. It could be, uh, an equipment company, let's say they sponsor a South Korean team, you know, you're, mm-hmm. you're going to have a, like a Latino or a Spanish speaking team. You, they're, they're going to have these teams that people will root for and their th- view. I don't know if this will work or not, but is these franchises have value. You would pay that money to live, to have the franchise. The player captains would probably cash in on some of that. Um, it's all kind of jumbled because they were forced to get into this kind of little haphazardly. And so the team part of it hasn't really gained traction. People are making fun of it right now because the teams are changing. We don't have the same fields every week, but right. next year in theory, you're going to have the same 48 guys in the same 12 teams competing throughout the year. And you're still going to have the big indiv- individual part of it which of course is going to be, uh, you know, a big, a big part of the, you know, obviously the prize money, $4 million. So, you know, I just don't think it's going away. Do I think it's good? I mean, it has the chance to be, um, but unfortunately where, uh, uh, you know, what's happened is, is now we've kind of divided golf and I don't think that's good. I don't think it's good that Bryson DeChambeau and Dustin Johnson aren't going to play in another tournament with PGA Tour players until the Masters. 
I don't think that's right. good at all. And so, you know, I'm not blaming anyone. I mean, I understand the tour digging its feet in and wanting to preserve what it's had. It's, it's worked pretty darn well for 50 some odd years in their current structure. But I just think they might have been a little remiss in not taking this more seriously. And certainly they're aware that players wanted guaranteed money. It's been talked about for years. Like, why can't a guy, well, if you make the tour, how about a stipend? Or every week, shouldn't you get something, even if you miss the cut? And they've never really done that. Mm-hmm. And now it's gone, it's gone so far beyond that sort of thing that whatever they do is going to be difficult to compare but they probably need to try to do something. And now, you know, we're looking at, do they have to actually work with them? I don't know if that's possible, but they might have to consider it. Otherwise we are going to have a fractured sport going forward. Yeah. I, I remember the first year I played, uh, we were at Q school in 2001 and, and you know, I was in my mid twenties then. And I remember a lot of the older guys, elder statesmen at that time uh, were complaining about, getting releases after they met their 15 tournament minimum so that they could go wherever they wanted to go. If it was Asia to get appearance fee money and, and really be able to, to get that guaranteed money to, to make more regardless. I mean, even if they won that tournament, the prize money was less than half of what it was here in the U S but they were guaranteed uh, appearance fee money, which is what they had in Europe forever. And I, I in reading the recent article where Ernie Els was interviewed, where mm-hmm. he said that he came up with a, an agreement with I was a Tim Fincham that he he was allowed to 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 travel more and, and play outside of the U.S. So I, I and I, I'm surprised that that hasn't been talked about outside of a, a blip here or there. That one of the reasons that these guys are doing that when they talk about the freedom to do what they want, part of that is to be able to play in other places once they met the criteria of the PJ Tour to allow them to to pad their pocketbook some more. And I, I think the tour left themselves wide open, just taking the position that. There's no other game in town. I know this is our rule for membership, but we're not going to let you go play in Australia for this event or in Europe for this event where you're going to make an extra $300,000 just to go. I, I, so I, to, to your point, I think the PJ Tour opened themselves up for something like this to come along and start siphoning off players sure. uh, with, with big money and with, with that hole being wide open. And Greg Norman is not dumb as far as – you might not like him, not, not you – Bob Herrig, but somebody out there listening might not like him, but you cannot deny that the, he is a very, very good businessman and his career spent on the PGA tour, knowing what a lot of the general public doesn't know. He knows exactly what to do and where to do. Now he might be getting lucky a little bit, but he, he knows what things that, that are missing where he can feel that, that guys are really going to gravitate or think hard about making that jump versus staying. Well, listen, I could, I could argue both sides of this. Norman is a great example of why this is a thing. Back in his day, back when he was a star, he went through the same thing Ernie mm-hmm. did. And at least when Ernie came along, there was a, um, a home tour rule. Uh, but in, in Greg's case, he wanted to go play in Australia in the wintertime. He's from there. Of course he did. But anything mm-hmm. beyond three releases – they made it hard on him. He would like to. He typically wanted five or six, seven a year. He wanted to play in Europe and get the guaranteed money. He wanted to take advantage of his stature, and then he'd want to play three or four in Australia. Anything beyond three, the tour would extract favors from him. They would say, "We want you to play." Okay, in order to get that release, we want you to play in Milwaukee next year. We want you to play Milwaukee mm-hmm. two of the next three years. It was the same with Ernie. Ernie had to add tournaments to his schedule to add those extra events. And that bothered him. I mean, he's like, if I play my 15, why isn't that okay? You're telling me if I want to add another tournament in Europe or South Africa, I've got to make it 20. Basically, that's what the tour did. They got him to add tournaments in exchange for him getting other releases. Now, maybe that's the best way for the tour to handle it. Um, On the other hand, if you're the tour, they've set up their – program sold tv rights deals and sponsorship agreements to to the networks and to the to the corporate sponsors saying look we're going to guarantee you some semblance of a strong field or a good field every week and one of the ways we do that is by making guys play 15 times here and they have to get permission to play elsewhere 
In other words, they can't play opposite your event unless we give them permission to. And with that system, you should all get your share of good players. If they lower that number or just don't have uh, any restrictions, now they've sort of devalued their TV and their sponsorship deals. And that's what pays the purses. So this is a double-edged sword. I mean, the players want the high purses, but they also want to be able to do whatever they want. And what they're missing there is that the tour has those rules for a reason. Now, maybe they need to be willing to accept less in terms of purses and sponsorship fees in order to gain that freedom, you know? But um, that's it's not an easy thing to, to solve. So, uh, and that's why we're where no, we're I, at I, right I now. I would have thought... That- that, that they would have come up with, and I, I, I had heard the rumor that, that it was, but I, I, I think it was just a rumor where the tour was going to have, you know, s- similar to you, you see those things on social media, wh- whatever sport, pick basketball or football or golf, and it's like you have X amount of money to spend, and he, here's someone you got to pick to drive the ball for you, and it's $10 or $20 a person, and, and you got to pick someone from bracket B that's $5 a per. you know what, I don't, I'm not sure if you've seen those on, Mm-hmm. online but um where, where the tourist says okay we have four categories a b c d a's would be the arnold palmer's the invitationals the the uh the the, the bigger more popular events and you know you're going to out of this pool you're going to have to play in three five tournaments a year out of the b pool you're going to have to play in three out of the c you're going to have to play in two and out of the d's you're going to play in at least one so the milwaukee opens and the or you know the Barbasol that that they get some bigger name players so that they're not down to 44 on the money list. Uh, at least it, there's a rotation of that, and I I, I never saw that. I, I I get what you're saying that they they've got to protect or else they're going to start losing these these smaller city events. Um, it, it's a very difficult situation, but the, the, I I do know for a fact that that was always a gripe. That hey, once I hit my minimum, if I want to go play in Australia or Cape Town. The, the old million dollar challenge going way back. I'm going to age myself or <laughs> Abu Dhabi, which isn't really a conflicting event. But if, if I want to do that based off your rules, you're not letting me do it. I can see where there's a gripe. Sure. I mean, to, and to your point about spreading the wealth among tournaments with the, their, their most recent um, announcement, you know, to enhance several tournaments with big money purses, they're going to increase the tournament of champions to 15 million. They're going to mm-hmm. increase the Genesis, the Arnold Palmer, and the Memorial, the legacy events, Tiger, Arnie, Jack, to $20 million. They're going to increase the match play to $20 million. They're going to increase the playoff events, the first two, to $20 million. Obviously, you want to get in the playoffs, but it's a smaller number now, only 70 guys. Well, if you play all those events, well, what does that do to the other events? You know, if you play, if you play the, the Century, play Arnold Palmer, Tiger, Jack match play, you play. Um, oh, and the players is going to twenty five million. The players, then you play um, the the two playoff events. Obviously, you're hoping to get in the tour championship. I think I've just come up with eight tournaments right there. Now there's then you throw in the four majors, and that's twelve. You know that doesn't leave a whole lot of room yep. for the Valspars, the Hondas, you know the John Deers, and if anything, they've created a little bit more separation there. So while those players who and and again, some of those tournaments have no cut, but some of them do, and so you still have to perform. You're not guaranteed anything unless you make the cut. So it's great if you make the cut and have a good finish, but it doesn't really get to the root of, you know, some of these guys feel that they should. You know, I've I've said this many times. Imagine if you're, oh, I don't know, any pro athlete today who travels on a team plane. He gets his meals paid for on the road, plus a per diem, stays in a luxury hotel. Mm -hmm. The training staff, he doesn't pay for. You know, if if he wants a sports psychologist or a hitting coach, he can use the teams. I'm sure he can hire his own, I suppose. In golf, none of that's paid for. These guys are paying their own way. Now, granted, you know, Tiger can afford a, a, you know, a private plane, but that had to be monumentally expensive to fly that to, to the UK, you know, probably mm-hmm. 150,000, 200,000 dollars round trip just to fly over there and back. And he Oof. made nothing. Now I'm not saying they need to cover that, but you know, he had a house, he had a rent or a hotel he was in, 
you know, he brings his caddy over, um, you know, he has a trainer that does follow, come with him. He's paying that guy. That's all him paying that. And, and, but okay, let's take it down several levels. A guy who doesn't make anywhere near that money. So I kind of get where they're coming from on that. And, mm-hmm. and so I've tried to understand both sides. I certainly get the tour side. They've made a lot of people very, very wealthy over the years. They've had a, a system that, that funnels a ton of money to charity. They give a lot of playing opportunities the way they are. Now there's the Corn Ferry, which is a developmental tour. It's hard to make a great living out there, but you can make money. You know, they've done a lot of good things too. So, um, again, though, it's, it's obviously not enough to, to hold off this other, this other idea that's out there, and it's only going to probably get worse unless somehow some smart people come together and figure it out. Yeah, the, the, I, 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 people ask me, what side are you on? I said, well, I, I'm interested to see this live and, and what they do. I'm not pro or anti live. I'm, I'm just, as a golf fan, I'm, I'm curious to, to see what they do and, and how they change things and different ideas. But, but what irks me is the overwhelming majority of uh, the, the traditional golf media has been completely anti-live and and just bashing them every which way they can, at least from what I've seen. Now that might be anecdotal. I'm not sure, but from everyone, all the friends I talk to in in the industry say something very similar. And what, what really irritates me is the PGA tour. Who's been this beacon of tradition and uh, honor and and all these other things. They bash the players uh, either through their own responses or through the players on the tour who are, who, more or less of the faces of the tour. And they say, all oh, these guys are just doing it for the money. They're, and that's the only thing. It's not about the honor of this or that. And then the first thing the PJ tour guys is go announce how they've increased the purses. It's like, wait a second, <laughs> you, you're going to berate a guy for leaving for the money. And the first thing you do is increase the purse. Now I know yeah. they need to, but I'm just saying you, you, you can't have it both ways. Um, the, the, the thing if, you if said, the guys, t- 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 Oh, I'm sorry. The thing you said about the, most of the media bashing live, um, I don't know if it's most, but it's certainly, I would say, more are than aren't. And I actually don't have any problem with that as mm-hmm. long as you disclose the reason why we're here. You have to disclose yes, and, and why we are here. That. Why was this possible? You, have, you can criticize it all you want. You can make fun of the format. You can make fun of all the money you're selling out, mm-hmm. the Saudi influence, all that stuff. But you have to acknowledge it got to this point because of some of these deficiencies I've pointed out, you know, and there's really not a defense for that. You might think that the way the tour has done it is fine and they should all live with it. Okay. If that's your defense, at least point it out, say it. Look, I know that, Mm -hmm. you know, the guys want to have guaranteed money and I know that, that uh, they get paid nothing if they miss a cut and they pay their own expenses, but that's the great thing about golf. You only, you only get what you earn. Okay, if that's your stance, fine. But acknowledge that that is why this could become possible because there's a, just a growing sentiment of players and agents who feel that's wrong. And look at all the guys who've gone. And have for a long time. Yeah. That, look that, at all the yeah, guys who've gone. New. That's been going on for a long time. You know, and I, I, you know, Phil took a ton of grief at the beginning because he was the lone wolf out there. But the bottom line is, is if that hadn't happened in February and they had launched the way they said they were going to going to or wanted to live, that is, there was a dozen guys lined up right with him to jump. And they all backed off when he went over the cliff. Every one of them, they let mm-hmm. kind of let Phil hang out to dry. Now, you can make the argument that Phil did a good job of harming himself. Fine. But the bottom line <laughs> is, is he wasn't the only one that was going to do this. And now we've seen all the guys who've joined on. And a lot of them were rumored. DeShambo, Kepka, mm-hmm. Dustin Johnson. Uh, you know, those guys were all, you know, Poulter, Westwood, Keimer. Those guys were all thought to be interested in this five months ago. And, and they all backed off. And then, and then when it finally came to fruition, they did it. And, and I shouldn't say all me, the main – I should say a lot of the, the golfing media that a lot of people tune into quite a bit is – like, because I've read a lot of your things, and I, I think it's very unbiased. I, I think you do what you say, that you're looking to see both sides and what are the reasonings for, for each side doing what they're doing or w- what has opened the door for, for something like Live to, to come in. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
th things like um, the Golf Channel, I think they've been heavily biased one way. Um, I in their mo most of that led by Brandel and, and Eamon. Uh, I, I think that the rest of the Golf Channel has, like in the in the pre and post game, that they they've tried to portray a more uh, checks and balances type approach who they have on and, and what they discuss. But uh, I, I I'm just seeing a lot, and, and I can I, I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying that that's sure. out there, and I, I just wish that if they're going to be respect ha have the respect that they deserve, then th they should approach it as a reporting and not a I'm going to take this side. Well, Brand, you know, Br opinion. Brandel and Amon are, 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 you know, they're commentators, they're, you know, they're columnists or, 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 um, you know, they're, they're, they're paid to give their opinion. And so I have no problem with their opinion. You know, I, I think mm -hmm. that it's perfectly justified to feel that way. If you have this issue with the Saudi government and them being part of this, I get that completely. The, I guess the problem I would have though, is that they, they aren't necessarily explaining why this came to be. You know, I think you have to at least acknowledge. Yes, I agree. Like I was saying before, hey, look, the tour didn't do everything right along the way, and that's why there's some just, you know, there's some discord here. And the other thing is, is look, let's be honest. I, I completely believe that they are sincere in their feelings. They're they're too passionate mm -hmm. about their viewpoints to not be. But let's say they were 180 degrees the other way, and they were that exactly that way towards live. Would they be able to say that? I don't think so. You know, no, Golf Channel no is is has a very very close relationship with the PJ Tour. I mean, the PJ Tour's logo is part of Golf Channel's logo. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. so there's going to be a level there of, you know, they have to they have to be careful. I, I get it. That's business. They're they're in business with the tour. You can imagine that any time that they were positive about live, they'd be getting a call, and so. That's the other problem I have with, again, I have no issues with their, with their opinions on this at all. There's a lot of people who hold those opinions, and they, they have a lot of justification. But you have to disclose why we got to this point because it's not just the greed of the players. It's, it, it's been festering, and, and, and here we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that the, the ethical argument is there, but when, when I hear the ethical argument, I'm like, in today's modern global society and, ec and economy, it's like, where do you draw the ethical line? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that that causes a big problem because every everyone's ethical lines are different and, and they're not going to align the same. Uh, not anymore. This is you know, not like it would have 20 or 40 years ago. Right. But it, it's, a, it's a it's playing out. And it, it's a kind of a fun movie or series to watch, so to speak, um, like a real life golf game of thrones <laughs> <laughs> that you just tune in each day or each week to see what the latest is so it's very cool um i, I know i'm probably keeping you a little longer than than we originally thought i appreciate you coming on and uh like to have you on again as, as this thing plays out and you hear more and i hear more and we can bring it to the masses that'd be great i'd have be happy to do it pete i appreciate you having me awesome so everybody check it out uh tiger versus phil and what was it the under the second part of the, the title golf's um, most fascinating rivalry and I'll, I'll have a link to that is it best to link where, where's the best place that, that people can go get that buy it check it out yeah amazon's the easiest if you want to just have it at your house the next day it'll it'll <laughs> if you order it on there you'll get it in a day or two and it's at barnes and noble and all the bookstores too but uh amazon's pretty easy I'll have the link in the summary. I highly recommend everybody follow you online as your you know, Sports Illustrated columnist, and, and you write. You got some very good stuff, and I uh, enjoy reading you. Thank you, Pete. Great, appreciate it.